Hello, and welcome to Aviation 101 with Laura. Last week, I was teaching our aircraft dispatch class, and we had a regional airline come to do some interview practice with my dispatch class, which went really well. And while they were there, they actually left me a copy of their test. So this is a paper test from a regional airline. And I asked them if I could make a video about the test going over all the questions. They said, yeah, we don't care. That's fantastic. Uh, just don't say where you got it. And I was like, OK, do you need me to change the questions or anything? And they said, no, just go for it. And I was like, OK, my audience will love this. So that is how I obtained this test. Now, what they did tell me is what they will do is invite people in for interview, give them this test. It's a paper test. They take it and grade it after you take the test. And then if they like how you answered on the written part of the test, then this particular company moves on to actually advance to the next part of the interview. So this means you should be studying if you are expecting to do well at an aircraft dispatcher job interview. And if you want to check out other videos I've got about practice interview and getting ready for interview, um, I would love it if you would check those videos out and I will link to them in this video's description. So without further ado, I'm just going to go through each of these question by question. We'll throw up a few resources along the way to help you with your study, but let's go. So first off, there were some regulation questions. And to release a flight under IFR operations, current observations, forecasts, or a combination thereof indicate that the weather will be, and then they want you to fill in the blank. So dot, dot, dot. Answer, at or above authorized landing minimums at the destination and at or above alternate minimums for any alternates at the ETA for both of those and also above takeoff minimums at the departure airport. So that would be a very complete answer that you could give for that question. They really emphasized knowing certain parts of 14 CFR by numerical reference which kind of surprised me slightly. So make sure you're studying the actual numerical reference for regional and major airlines, because they said a major airline that they are familiar with also requires this, and they look for that during dispatch interviews. So what are the three things the dispatcher is responsible for in accordance with 14 CFR 121.533? Now, I will have to say, this is a great book. I actually finally got my new version. Check it out. Um, there's a product description and a product link coming up in the video. And in the video description, you can find this. So check it out. Also, when you're going to practical dispatch tests, do make sure you have current year version of this book because it's great. So the three things that the responsible dispatcher is covered under by 14 CFR is monitoring the flight progress, issuing information for safety of flight, and then canceling or redispatching if the flight cannot continue safely. All right, another 14 CFR where this question, they actually wanted you to know, what is the specific rule number? How much do you adjust a high minimums captain approach minima? That part's easy for me. I honestly, to be totally honest, I did actually have to look it up in my book to figure out what is the, what is the actual number of this reg. So first of all, you add 100 feet to the decision altitude or decision height or MDA of the approach. And then you add a half a mile or the RVR equivalent to the required visibility for the approach. It should never be less than 300 feet and one statute mile. And the reference is 121.652. Cool. I don't know, maybe memorize like two times five is 10 add a zero for 100. I don't know. Or there's a five in the middle for half a mile. I'm not sure how I'd memorize that one, but you, I'm sure you can think of something. You guys are smart. When do you require an alternate? 121.619. Again, slightly interesting question because I really was like, ooh, is 121.619 domestic flag or supplemental? Turns out it is domestic. So for domestic operations, anytime plus or minus an hour of your ETA at the destination, if the weather indicated has a ceiling of less than 2,000 feet or visibility less than three statute miles at your destination, 
then you need an alternate, commonly known as the one, two, three rule. I have a really fun video called the alternate game where we go through this and I will link to that in the video description so you can practice with some real weather from a tap. All right, another 121,647. They give you the reference this time, but they're like, what are the factors required for computing fuel? Okay, this is fairly obvious, but in the reg, it does say wind and any other weather conditions and any anticipated traffic delays, flying one approach and a published missed approach, and then, quote, from the FAA, any other conditions that may delay landing of the aircraft. That's a catch-all phrase for better put on enough fuel for the flight. Yay. Okay, so after some random questions about important regulations, this test moved into weather questions. So what are the three primary types of icing? Pretty simple. Rhyme, mixed, and clear icing. Just fill in the blank, okay? What's the primary cause of weather on Earth? And I should answer also for all these questions, it was just fill in the blank. There was not like multiple choice or not true false. It's just complete fill in the blank essay question stuff. So primary cause of weather on the Earth is uneven heating and cooling of Earth's surface. Simple, simple answer. What are the three stages of a thunderstorm? Again, very popular question. We have the cumulus or building phase. We have the mature phase, and then we have the dissipating phase. This was also a fun question I like for essay questions. How does the thunderstorm actually form? So if you have the ingredients of a thunderstorm being atmospheric instability, moisture, and a lifting action, these combine to create thunderstorms. And that lifting action could come from frontal activity, could be from just convective heating of the Earth's surface. Convergence, meaning we have flow into a low pressure, air flowing into the low pressure and being forced upward, or orographic lifting, which sometimes is referred to as terrain, like mountain upslope air forming into a thunderstorm if it has enough moisture and lifting going on and instability. Okay. Ceiling, the definition of a ceiling, another fun meteorological question that also goes into 14 CFR, but it is the lowest cloud layer defined as broken or overcast or the visibility into a surface-based total obscuration. You can find it on a METAR as VV, which stands for vertical visibility. Okay, I loved this one. Ha, oh, decode this METAR. So if you want to practice decoding METARs, got some videos. I'll link to those in the description so you can practice, but here we have a good one to read out. We got Nashville, Tennessee uh, on the 20th of the month at 1513 Zulu. Observation wind 210 at nine or knots, one statute mile. Thunderstorm and heavy rain, mist. Broken clouds at 2200 cumulonimbus. Overcast clouds at 3500. Temperature 23, dew point 21 Celsius, altimeter 2981 inches of mercury. Remarks, it is a precipitation discriminator equipped station. The tower visibility is one and a quarter mile. A thunderstorm began at two minutes past the hour. There is occasional lightning in cloud overhead. A thunderstorm is overhead moving northeast and one one hundredths, or sorry, 11 tenths of an inch of rain fell in the last hour. We have the temperature 22.8 degrees Celsius, dew point 20.6 degrees Celsius. The RVR sensor is not working and this station needs maintenance. All right, decode a bunch of acronyms. Cool. Now this one, I actually had to look up a little bit of this because I was like, what does METAR actually stand for? So I looked at this the handy dandy aviation weather handbook. It is published by ASA. Super thick. It, you can download this as a PDF from the FAA. So I'll link to that. But uh, some of this, I, I really had to look up METAR because I was like, does it actually stand for something? So it is actually, according to that book, an aviation routine weather report. I'm really not, I, I'm sure somebody is going to comment nicely in the video comments for me to specifically say um, what it actually stands for. I thought it was a meteorological aviation report, but according to the Aviation Weather Handbook, FAA product, 
It's just aviation routine weather report. All right. Notice to airmen. Oh, got a typo in the middle. Whoops. Ah, okay. Significant meteorological information is a SIGMET. Traffic collision avoidance system is a TCAS system. Receiver autonomous integrity monitoring system relating to GPS. Instrument landing system. Area navigation. RNAV. And frontal passage. That was also a METAR acronym. So from that aviation weather handbook. All right, this is an interesting one. Describe how aircraft fly. So when we were talking about this in class with the airline recruiters, they were like, yeah, you could totally talk about Bernoulli's principle and describe that. That'd be fine. Um, I jokingly said, well, I probably would answer money. And they said they would take money as a correct answer for this question. So I don't know that I'd really do that on an interview, but do, do we want? Maybe you'll still get hired. I don't know. Okay. What makes RVSM airspace special and what flight levels are applicable to it? Okay. So RVSM stands for reduced vertical separation minimum airspace. It is where our cruise altitudes are separated from each other by 1,000 feet. And we find it in flight levels 2900 to flight level 410. And I think that what's really more special maybe about it for dispatchers is required equipment needs to be in the aircraft and functional, including a working autopilot, working altitude alerting system, and two independent altimeter systems. So, um, and the autopilot has to have altitude control hold. So I didn't put that on there, but these are items that if they were broken, so they were on the aircraft's minimum equipment list and then listed as an inoperative item, then the aircraft cannot fly into RVSM airspace and would have to be planned either below it or above it. Can an MEL be added in flight? Oh, this is a super easy answer. No, it cannot. No, if something breaks in flight, we would refer to the Quick Reference Handbook or QRH for abnormal procedures. MELs are only added on the ground. Okay. Kind of a dispatch resource management scenario, which might be interesting. Uh, check out my videos about that. I've posted a few um, basically dispatch resource management practice scenarios. But this one says a flight we dispatched without an alternate now has weather where it changed at the destination's estimated time of arrival where now it would require an alternate. The flight is en route. What do you do? Since the flight's en route, I cannot add fuel while we're in flight. We're not doing any air to air refueling of any kind of airliners. So legally, I do not have to add an alternate according to 14 CFR. That's not in the reg. However, my practice, good practice would be think about weather, think about traffic, think about potential delays, maybe have the aircraft land short to add fuel so that you can reach an alternate. Or if you have enough fuel on board the aircraft, you could identify an alternate that is within the current fuel range of the aircraft and then do a dispatch amendment, a release amendment to add that alternate with the crew by doing an in-flight amendment to the dispatch release. All right, so then uh, this airline included a bunch of Jeppesen charts. I wanna emphasize that they are going to expect you to be able to read Jeppesen charts and that is part of their interview process. So. They have included some of these charts, and here is one that they included asking, what is the field elevation of the airport? Now, they actually included the whole thing, but due to space constraints on my slides, I just gave you the part that really matters. And we can find in the corner that it says 606 feet MSL is the airport elevation. Cool. All right. Then they ask, what is the landing distance available for landing on runway 31 right? All right, so I think I'm going to actually draw on this slide a little bit because one thing they said they really like is to be sure people know how to read the little notes. Jefferson calls them ball notes on their slides, uh, on the charts. So here we have a slightly confusing thing. So 3 1 right, right here, we do have a note landing distance beyond the threshold. Okay, 8,375 feet, but there is a little note too. 
So then you have to look at the two note, which says that the last 625 feet is not available for landing distance computation. So 8375 minus 625 would give me 7,750 if I'm applying that note number two on the chart. Landing minimums for Category C aircraft conducting a Cat 1 ILS approach with centerline lights out for runway 18 right. Okay, so with this one, we can look at the bottom section of the chart with my landing minimums. For the ILS, landing minimums are only visibility, so don't talk about decision altitude. That's not part of landing minimum. There's no ceiling required for an ILS, so don't talk about that. With the centerline lights out of service, we have to use this box here. So we get an RVR of 2,400 or half statute mile. You can read the little one note. It's kind of punctured off with my hole punch, but RVR 1800 with flight director or autopilot or heads up display to the DA. Honestly, to keep this simple, I'm just going to say it's 2400 RVR or half statue mile because the center line lights are out of service. Another Jeppesen question, what are takeoff minimums for runway 18 left if the hurl is inoperative? Okay, I've got a whole video explaining takeoff minimums, so I highly recommend checking it out because it's going to help you learn to read this chart if you're not familiar. But for runway 18 left, we would be on this section here. If we have OPSPEC C78, we are permitted to use this section of the chart here. And that means with my hurl inoperative, but centerline lights working, I can use this box, which tells me that it is 1,000, 1,000, 1,000 RVR that is listed right there on the chart. Cool. If we didn't have OPSPEC C78, then we would be using the standard section of the chart, but they're actually looking for you to be able to apply C78. Last question was just a blank space where it said, draw your own airport with runways 422, 1836, and 927. Cool. Okay. Um, let's start somewhat simple. I'm just going to draw 1836. Whoop, nice. My mouse hung up. Okay. And I can even label these if I want to, although my handwriting is going to be super bad. I'm not going to do upside down. So there's 1836, 927. I don't really know if they would all be on top of each other like that, but yeah. Let's mark that. Notice my runways are labeled with what direction I'd be going. And then 422 would be, let's make a really horrible mess in the middle of this fantastic fictional airport. Okay. This would be 22. I'd be heading 220 if I took off that way, and 04 would be something like that. So there's my draw my own airport with runways 422, 1836, and 927. Cool. Hope you enjoyed that review. Uh, I think it's a fantastic test. You know, I was like, whoa, this is great. My class is totally reviewing and practicing for a regional airline interview. What kinds of things have you guys seen in regional airline interview for aircraft dispatcher? I would love to hear about it. Put it in the comments. And thank you so much for watching and subscribing to Aviation 101 with Laura. Have a great day.